everyone. We are picking up in Romans chapter 8. We're going to be doing about the first 17 verses of the chapter today, and we are at a high point in the book of Romans. These verses are the jewel in the crown of the book. It tells us some really wonderful things, some great truths. It says forth our freedom from condemnation, that we are indwelt by the Spirit, adopted into his family, and made heirs of God and share in its glory. It's a pile of jewels. This passage begins by picking up the idea of the new way of the Spirit from Romans chapter 7, verse 6. Paul had dropped the line of thought in order to deal with the teaching about the law, but he's now back to the idea of living under the Spirit and is picking it up again. The possession of the Spirit is really the mark of what it means to be in Christ. It defines what it means to belong to Jesus. The Spirit is very significant in this chapter. 21 times the word Spirit is used, and 19 of those refer to the Holy Spirit. And so the chapter begins with a very powerful and assertive statement. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The word therefore takes us back to all that came before this chapter. Everything Paul has taught us about our standing in Christ based on his death for us. In light of justification and redemption and grace, therefore no condemnation. Now that's an all-encompassing phrase. It's an assurance, a promise. It leaves no room for worry or concern about our future. And it's a promise that we have now. There is therefore now no condemnation. The reason for the assurance is in verse two. The law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. The word law in this verse is not the law of Moses. It most likely goes back to chapter 7, verse 23, which speaks of the principle or the law of sin that is at work in us. This law of the Spirit is the opposite of that law of sin. We are no longer under the reign of sin, but are under the reign of the Spirit. But in verse 3, the law referred to again is the law of Moses. That law was powerless to save us. It showed us the standard of God, but we could not live up to that standard. So God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He did this by sending his son. And that verse goes on to say, He came in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering and to condemn sin in sinful man. Saying he came in the likeness of sinful man does not mean that Jesus had a sin nature. It means he came in humanity sinless humanity, but fully humanity in every other way. In, every, in being sinless, he could be an offering for our sin. He met the standards of the law in his sinless life, and in his death, he fulfilled the judgment of the law required due to sin. God condemns our sin in Christ Jesus, but because, because, but because he did what he did, we are not condemned. So now we can fulfill the law, by living according to the Spirit. Now these verses contain a doctrine known in the church as the doctrine of the Trinity. That word Trinity is not used anywhere in the Bible. You won't find it if you look in a Bible dictionary or a Bible concordance for the word. Neither is there any one spot in the Bible where the doctrine is laid out and explained in full. So what is this doctrine and why do we hold to it? Well, the Bible teaches that there is only one God, but he exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When we speak of God, we are often referring to God the Father, but each of the three, according to the scripture, have all the characteristics, attributes, and power of God. Each bears the names of God and does the works of God. They live and work in complete unity, and each one can rightly be called God. The Bible has passages that indicate this unique relationship. There are times when God seems to be speaking to himself, or when he speaks of himself in the singular, and then he speaks of himself in the plural. For example, Genesis 1 verse 26 says, God, singular, said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, 
image, singular. And then there's an interesting couple of verses in Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Now let's stop there for a second. So God is going to come and live among them. He says he is the one, the Lord Almighty, who is going to come and live among them. Picking up again, many nations will be joined to the Lord in that day and will become my people and I will live among you. And you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. So suddenly the narrative switches so that the Lord is not only the one being sent to live among them, but the one doing the sending. In essence, he's sending himself. Although father and son are not mentioned here, that is who is being referred to. The father is sending the son, but both are spoken of as God. Both speak as God in this passage, as the Lord Almighty. In Romans, in this Romans passage, God, that would be God the Father, sent the Son so that we can live in the Spirit. All three are fully invested in our salvation and in our sanctification. As a result of the work God has done in Christ, believers are free from condemnation. Now, you might know some lovely, ethical, kind, even philanthropic people who seem to do good works entirely by their own power. And we can do some th good things in our own strength, but we can't free ourselves from the, the sentence of our sin. We can't fulfill the law in the perfect standards of God. Only Jesus can do that for us, and only he can free us from the condemnation of our sin. This is a source of hope and confidence. He frees us from the condemnation and he does it right now. And this is one of the core truths of Christianity. Now Paul begins to describe life in the spirit versus life in the flesh. In verse 3, the NIV uses the phrase sinful nature. If you're using another version, the word flesh is often used. The word flesh can have several meanings. It can mean the meat on an animal. It can mean humanity in general. It could refer to human ancestors, or it could refer to um, all that is a part, all that is in us that is full of sinful tendencies and that is apart from God. And the original Greek word includes all of those possible meanings in the word, and you have to use context to figure out which one is being referred to. When the last one is meant, that which is apart from God and has sinful tendencies, the NIV is using the phrase sinful nature. Paul is contrasting the flesh or the sinful nature and the spirit. He wants to make it clear that the spirit brings life, but the sinful nature brings death. In verse 5, the contrast is between the effect of each of those on our mindset. Now, our mindset denotes the basic direction of our will. The mindset of a sinful nature is focused on fulfilling the desires of that nature and is in line with a world that is in rebellion to God. On the other hand, the one who has the mind of the spirit, a mind set on the spirit, is wanting to fulfill the desires of the spirit. These people are believers. They, they stand in Christ. When Paul says, you are controlled in verse 9, he refers to those who stand in Christ. Throughout Romans, Paul has been speaking of people as in being one of two realms or under one of two reigns. And he's referred to it in a variety of ways. Sometimes he speaks as being condemned versus justified. And sometimes he talks about being slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. Other times he refers to these two as being in Adam or in Christ. And now it's, it's being referred to as living according to the sin nature or living according to the spirit. But there are only two groups, only the two regi regimes. We live in one or the other. There is no third option. In verses 9 to 11, he expands the idea of living according to the spirit with having the spirit living in us. So we're going to read verses 9 to 11. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, 
then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Paul is basically defining a believer, a person who is justified and in Christ and a slave to righteousness as being a person in whom the spirit dwells. He states right out in verse nine, if you do not have the spirit living in you, you do not have Jesus. You are not in Christ. The presence of the spirit is the mark of what it means to be a genuine believer. He also ties the idea of the spirit being in us with Christ being in us. In verse nine, it is the spirit in us. In verse 10, it's Christ. There is this union between God the Son and God the Spirit. They are distinct and yet one. To have one is to have the other. There is no halfway in our standing. You're either in Christ or out of Christ and in Adam. It is the Spirit that defines which you are. In Christ, if the Spirit is in you, then your body is dead because of sin. Now our physical bodies do still die in this world. We live in a fallen world. We still have sin in ourselves. And so physical death still comes on us as believers. But while our bodies die, our spirits are alive because of righteousness. You will notice that in that verse, the word spirit is a small s. This is referring to our human spirit, not the Holy Spirit. We may die physically, but spiritually we are alive. Furthermore, the spirit that lives in us, capital S, is the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. If the one who raised the physical body of Jesus lives in you, then he will someday raise your physical body from the dead as well. So Paul uses two different metaphors, that of us in the spirit and that of the spirit in us. The point is we live under the dominance of the spirit. The spirit is our fundamental orientation, the source of convictions and attitudes of heart that steer the course of our lives. Believers are to develop, to develop a spirit-led, spirit-filled disposition of heart and mind. This is necessary if we're going to live a life that pleases God. The spirit is the source of new direction and new desires that please God. Now, it's true that sometimes we're grabbed again by the power of sin and we fall back into it for a time, into our old ways. But over time, as we mature in Christ, we become more like him. The differences between Christians and non-Christians should become more and more apparent as we mature in our faith. We begin to feel totally different from the world around us than do the non-Christians. Are you finding that true of yourself? When the rest of the world sinks into pessimism, do you find yourself looking for what God is doing? When others despair, do you find yourself filled with hope? Are you finding the priorities of the world totally out of step with what you, you find to be a priority? How is the spirit reshaping your mindset? Okay, now we're going to pick up at verse 12. Paul begins to tell us of our obligation since the Spirit is in us, and it's not an obligation to our sin nature. The first part of verse 13 can cause some confusion and some debate. And it says, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. Now that brings up a question. Is this saying that a believer who sins can lose their salvation? This is a debated issue in the church. The doctrine in question is called the doctrine of eternal security. Can we sin so grievously that we will lose our salvation? When I originally studied the book of Romans, I read a bunch of commentaries on this subject, and I'm going to try and summarize what the majority of them had to say on this verse. The chapter began with, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who are not sinning or continuing to sin. The commentaries I read said that what Paul is saying is that a true believer is not a person who lives under sin, who sins and keeps on sinning. That person is dead spiritually, for they are not a true believer. 
Now, of course, we know people who have said they are believers and have fallen into sin and lived in it, even quite blatantly for quite a while, maybe even for some years. Some of them repent and return to walk with God, and some do not. The view of these commentaries I read is that the general teaching of Scripture is that true believers, although we sin, will not blatantly live in sin perpetually, but will return to God, for they are not slaves to sin. Now, this is a debated topic, and I'm going to leave it with you. One possible interpretation is that a person who lives in sin could be a believer who loses then their salvation for their uh, choice to live in sin. And another possible interpretation is that a person who does that and does not eventually repent and return to Christ was not a genuine believer in the first place and is spiritually dead. Personally, I am a believer in eternal security, but I'm not going to fight you on it. I'll just leave it with you to think about. Back in verse 13, the last portion of the verse says, But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The tense of the verb put to death means continue to put to death. In other words, this is a battle that has to be fought all the time. Verses 14 and 15 tell us the nature of the new relationship we have entered into with God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 14 speaks of being led by the Spirit. Now, we often think of the leading of the Spirit as being about major decisions. Should I take up this ministry position or should I not? Should I go to this university or that one? Should I marry that guy? Should my husband take this new job opportunity, even though it means we have to move to Iceland? But in reality, it has more to do with being led in the moral and ethical decisions of daily life. It is about daily obedience. He might show you, for example, that buying that cute little black dress and wearing it to the office Christmas party and then returning it the next day is not ethical. Or that you should return the $20 too much that the cashier gave you in change because it's the morally right thing to do. He does help us and direct us in the big decisions, but the majority of his guidance is in those small ethical choices that we have to make day in and day out. Then, it, then the verse says that we have received the spirit of sonship, the spirit of adoption. The Jews did not usually practice adoption, but the Romans did. So the concept was quite well understood in the culture. They would take in a child that was not their own and confer on that child all the rights and privileges of a natural child. They might disown a natural child who disappointed them, but an adopted child was not ever disowned. The thought was that when you took that adopted child in, you knew what you were getting into. You, had, you knew what that child was already like, and so you did not set them aside. And this is the image of the sort of relationship we have with God. This relationship is a familiar and intimate one. We are allowed to call God Abba. Abba is the intimate and personal name used for a father in Hebrew. It is like our word daddy. Jesus used this term for God the Father in Mark 14, 36. The point is that we are now on the same close, intimate relationship with God the Father as Jesus enjoyed. We are fully accepted and loved. And this is further assurance that we are secure in our relationship with God. Verse 16 says that the Spirit that is the Holy Spirit, testifies with our own spirit that we are the children of God. He provides the family tie between us and God. He assures us inwardly that something has changed and we belong to God. Verse 17 says that not only are we children, but we are heirs of God. We have an inheritance coming. The line of reasoning in the passage goes from the spirit being in us to this tie we have as sons, children of God 
to being those who have an inheritance. We share the inheritance of the Father with the Son. We now belong to the ultimate in-group, dearly loved children. Through the Spirit, believers have an identity and an inheritance. God has taken us in. Through the Spirit, we are tied to the family line of God. We fully and completely belong, not because we deserve to be there, but because God, forgetting our origins, has adopted us and conferred on us all the rights and privileges of children. And he knew what he was getting into. It is like the couple that could not have children, so they adopted a boy. And shortly after the adoption, they discovered they were, they were expecting a child. So another boy was born, and these two boys were fairly close in age. One day, a visitor to the home asked the mother which of the boys was hers. And the mother said, both of them. The visitor said, no, no, I mean, which one did you give birth to? And the mother looked her right in the eye and said, I don't remember. In the same way, God does not remember that we were not always his. We are adopted and therefore totally secure. The Spirit ties us to God. The Spirit defines what it means to belong to God. He empowers us to live for God, providing the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. He is the guarantor of our inheritance. He is our guide, showing us the ethical behavior in us and teaching us to obey God. If we don't have the Spirit, we don't have Jesus. How are you seeing his power and his guidance in your life? How is he giving you confidence in your standing as a child of God? Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What a great promise.